In a recent video, I discussed hooks in board game design. The hook is the key feature which draws players in, the thing which makes them want to engage. It could be the theme of the game, it could be the mechanisms, or it could be contextual, the reputation of the designer or publisher. In this video, we're not focusing on any of these. We're looking at physical hooks. In board game circles, we call this table presence. I'm Adam Porter, I'm a game designer from Wales. In 2018, Brain Games released my trick-taking game Picoco. The game garnered a lot of attention, but not necessarily from the sectors that I had anticipated. Many gamers did enjoy the game, it even won a couple of awards, but I was most surprised by the interest from toy companies. The card holders really caught their imagination. I was invited to talk on panels to toy industry professionals, to pitch ideas to mass market toy companies, to speak to product design students about board game design. And the weird thing was, none of these people had actually played the game. The defining feature of Picoco was not the gameplay as I'd imagined, but the presentation. I recently received complimentary copies of two games from German publisher Zoch Verlag, Kip Saures and Strand Unter. Both are fun games, and as with Pococo, their core hook is not the gameplay, but the memorable physical components. The goal of Kip Saures is to score the most victory points by completing packages of sweets. The game focuses around a large cardboard contraption consisting of three tubes balanced over a central stand. Each player has three large dice of three different colours, and likewise for three medium dice and three small. On your turn, you place a single die inside any one of the tubes, and you're hoping that the tube will tip over, spilling dice on your turn, because then you're going to have the first opportunity to select a die from that pool. Once you've taken a dice and used its associated action, each other player in turn selects a die for themselves. The action you take depends on the colour of the tube which spilled the dice. If your dice come from the copper tube, you take coloured cubes representing sweets from the supply, matching the number and colour of the die that you selected. You also keep the die itself. If the tube the die came from was silver, you select a card from the central display. This is an objective you'll need to complete, a point scoring package of sweets. You can only select a card matching the colour of the die you selected unless you select a mixed package, in which case you need to match the number on the die to the number of ingredients on the card. But a die showing 6 is wild and allows you to select any mixed package. If the tube the die came from was golden, then you can complete a package. Choose a card in front of you which matches the die you selected, discard the required sweets and place the die onto the card to show that the package is complete. The game ends when one player has completed their fifth package and players total the scores on their completed packages. There's a bonus for completing one package of each colour, including a mixed package, and an individual bonus for having the most completed packages of each colour. In Strandunter, the game board is a plastic beach with grooves corresponding to each round of the game. A blue sheet lays across the beach representing the sea. For the first eight rounds of the game, the sea moves outwards with the tide, revealing one extra groove full of shells each round. And for the final few rounds, the tide comes back in. Each round, all players simultaneously reveal their chosen action for the round. Take a single shell in a sandcastle, or take a selection of shells. The chosen actions are resolved from the left of the dial to the right. If a player's gathered enough appropriately coloured shells, they can build one of their sandcastles in the groove corresponding to the current round. But if you build that too far out, you run the risk of your castle being destroyed when the tide returns. The game ends when one player has built their fourth castle, and then players total their points from the value of castles they've built, assuming they're still standing, and the value of the grooves they've built them in. So it pays to push your luck and build closer and closer to the sea. At the end of the game, the highest scorer wins. With over a thousand games being released each year, it's easy for really fun games to get lost in the shuffle. A strong physical presence can really lift a product, making it visible among a sea of competitors. For consumers in 2022, gorgeous artwork is an expectation rather than a selling point. So game makers have started to look to the third dimension, extending their games vertically in order to literally stand out. Stacking bamboo stalks in Takenoko to recreate the colourful Japanese garden, or creating temples from resin pieces in Tikal, or placing plastic palm trees and statues in Tobago. These are the peaceful equivalents of warring miniatures, the gentler cousins of the mechs in Scythe, or the ninja clans of TMNT Shadows of the Past. 
But table presence is about more than pieces occupying a board. Some games experiment with the board itself. In Brain Games Ice Cool, the board is created from a stack of boxes within boxes, creating a large arena for the penguin flicking players. In worker placement game Everdell, cards and components are placed on the upper branches of a cardboard tree, a feature with little utility but great aesthetic appeal. The goal is to make your game look great from across the room, and towering game pieces are hard to miss. They also look great in photographs. When I was a kid, some of the biggest selling board games were Ghost Castle, Hero Quest, and Mouse Trap. All games which knew that three-dimensional components counted for an awful lot, especially if you wanted to stand out in a 1980s Christmas catalogue. Forty years on, some publishers incorporate distinctive, but entirely unnecessary contraptions in their games. The bird box dice tower in Wingspan, which really serves little purpose beyond separating used from unused dice. The pyramid dice dispenser in Camel Up, which could easily be replaced with a simple cloth bag. You could dismiss these devices as cynical ploys, unnecessary chrome included to squeeze a few more pounds out of undiscerning consumers, but I think you'd be missing the point. Wingspan's bird box and Camel Up's pyramid are a significant part of the identity of those games. Yes, the pieces could easily be set aside and replaced with something simpler, but the games would be lesser without them. Atmosphere in games is important. The strength of Zox devices in particular is they're not unnecessary at all. In fact, the games are built around the devices rather than the device being built to supplement the game. Kip Saures couldn't exist without the teetering tubes. Integrating physicality into the game design from the earliest stages is a design philosophy which Zoch knows well. Their Spiel des Jahres winner Niagara used the box as a river and waterfall, with transparent discs representing the flow of the water. I recently reviewed Zox Gazanka auf der Planke, a simple pirate game where players attempt to unbalance a rocking pirate ship to send their opponents overboard. Physical design is similarly integrated into the game Pika Mouse from Gigamic, where players peer through the windows of a house lit by a small bulb with a built-in 30-second timer. The best devices in games create moments. Players shriek when the tubes topple in Kipmir Saures, they hold their breath when the pirate ship sways in Gazanka auf der Planka, and they groan when the lights go out in Pika Mouse. So what does this all mean for us as game designers? Well, maybe nothing, and maybe a lot. The spark of an idea can come from anywhere, so why not a contraption, a cardboard device, a gimmick, a widget? One of the most frequent questions asked of game designers is, theme or mechanisms, what comes first? Well, how about neither? Starting your design from a physical component is every bit as valid and could create that rare thing in the board game industry, a product which is truly unique. Let me know in the comments, what's your favourite game with great table presence? And if you enjoyed the video, please watch some of my others, hit like, subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next time. All the best.